Good morning, everyone. So I thought I'd take some time and discuss the failed airway approach, go through the steps with you so you understood that when we have someone who's alive and their SpO2 is decreased, we can't leave it decreased. And by decrease, I mean under 85%. Now you can use your tools in your toolbox in, a various, in various ways. In this particular case, I'm going to be showing you how to do it with a bag valve mask on somebody who is unconscious and the progression that you make and the decisions that you make so that you improve that SpO2 above 85%. So I've come in and I've got this gentleman and he is uh, unconscious. He's not looking at me when I walk in. So I'm going to come straight up to him and say, sir, wake up and see what he does. And unfortunately he doesn't do anything. So then I'm gonna give him painful stimuli and see what he does. He doesn't groan, he doesn't move the pain away, he doesn't open his eyes, so he's technically a GCS of three. He is deeply unconscious. So the next step I need to, to ask myself is, well, there's indications here for um, BLS airways, but I need to figure out which one, right? So I'm gonna check blink reflex. Run your eyes along the, the eyelid and see if his eyelashes flicker. And he doesn't have a gag reflex. He doesn't flicker. So that means I'm going to take an OPA and I'm going to size and I'm going to insert it. So from the corner of the mouth to the earlobe or from the middle of the mouth to the angle of the jaw, which is right here. Angle of the jaw, middle of the mouth. Either or gives you the correct insertion sizing. So upside down, open his mouth up, twist it around his tongue. The flange should rest against his lips or his teeth. Okay, either is acceptable. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assess his rate, depth, and quality of breathing. And I find out he's breathing at two. It's regular, but it's shallow. Well, that's not enough to sustain life. So I'm going to take out a BVM. And not only am I going to grab a mask, but I got other things to set up with this. So let's go through that quickly. We have a diverter for PEEP. And then we have a PEEP valve. This PEEP valve, the blue piece turns and numbers will show up on it. When you're bagging, you can start at five as a minimum, but it's better to go straight to 10 because you get mask leakage from your seal. So as you can see, my peep is now set to 10. It connects to my diverter like so, and then it connects to my BVM by flipping it upside down and pushing it straight on my BVM so it should look like that. Anything less than that is incorrect. The next thing you need to connect is a side stream ETCO2. That only goes on one way if you're putting this on correctly. The next thing you need to do is protect you and everybody else from the coronavirus. Okay, and again, this only goes on one way. That's a HEPA filter. Okay, it's gonna catch any pathogens within the filter in there and you're not gonna get it. Then that attaches to your BBM mask and we begin ventilations. One breath every five seconds. One two, three, four, five. You'll notice that my ventilation goes in one for one second and I let the patient breathe out for four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And I'm gonna do this for three or four breaths. I'm gonna delegate somebody to get an SpO2 on my patient and an ETCO2 and let's see where things are at. Now let's talk about SpO2 specifically. I get an SpO2 on this patient who is, let's say he's overdosed on heroin and his SpO2 is only 66%. That is not okay and what I'm doing here is good but it's not good enough. So it means I need to fix that somehow. So this is all about oxygenation and improving how his brain and his heart and his lungs and his kidneys are getting O2. So we're gonna progress with our toolbox. We're gonna size and insert two NPAs. That's our next step. So first you need to size the correct diameter, right? How big the actual NPA is. And we can do that by making sure it fits nice and snug into the nair, or you can take your pinky finger nail, the patient's pinky finger nail, pardon me, and we can size the beveled end to it, okay? Then we need to size the insertion depth from the tip of the nose to the tragus. The tragus, folks, is this little piece of your ear here, right there. Tip of the nose to the tragus. That'll be our correct insertion depth. 
And the school of thought is, is if you're going to do one NPA, let's just go for two. So we're going to lube the distal end. We're going to start with the patient's right nair, bevel then towards the septum. And if you meet resistance, you're going to twist to the outside until you can pass it past the, the nasal turbinances. And we're going to insert the, all the way to the end of the nose. Flange should go to the end of the nair. Same thing with the other side. Bevel towards the septum. Again, we've done our sizing, uh, tip of the nose to the tragus. We've checked the diameter. Bevel towards the septum, twist to the outside, and then rotate until it's in a midline position. Now we go back to breaths. And this will take you about four to five breaths to see if this is working. So again, we're gonna do four to five breaths. We're gonna monitor SpO2. One, two, three, four, five. And I'm noticing my SpO2 went up to 70%. Oh, that's good. I'm gonna do another breath. One, two, three, four, five. And I'm watching the SpO2 start to climb. It's now 73%. This is good, I'm trending in the right direction. But I need it up over 85, and two breaths isn't enough. We gotta give it a couple more breaths to see if it's gonna work or if we need to add more. So now it's up at 76%. Still not good enough, but I'm headed in the right direction, so I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. Now I'm at 80%. And as I continue with my ventilations, one breath every five seconds equates to 12 breaths a minute. I'm noticing that I'm not really moving from 80% anymore. And at five breaths, that should be more than enough for you to get to where you need to be at its peak. So that tells me what I'm doing is right, but it's just not enough. So I'm gonna do some more. So I'm gonna get a partner in here with me and we're gonna do two person bagging. This is the most important thing that you can do on, on ambulance, on a real patient that is the most effective in improving oxygenation status. We do this all the time. Somebody is gonna bag from the side and you at the head. Now, I'm gonna disconnect this because I'm all by myself here, folks, okay? You can do a C and E seal like this. It's not great though. In real life, that does not improve your seal. What I want you to do is take your thumbs marry them here at the mask at the end of the mask take your fingers like spiders grab the jaw and lift okay this is magical in real life okay this is the best way you can provide an effective seal for a patient and we're gonna do the person at the head is going to hold the mask never from the side and you're going to have somebody provide how many ventilations five ventilations one two three four five two two person bagging with two npas and an opa for five breaths okay oh look our sat is rising to 85 percent awesome and now it's at 86 percent good we're headed in the right direction our goal is to get to 100 percent but unfortunately it's not really going any higher we're at breath three and it's only at 86 percent i'm starting to think this might not be enough we'll see Still at 86%. Hmm. Still at 86%. Now what's indicated, because you're doing max BLS, two person bagging, two NPAs, an OPA, high flow O2 at 15 liters into your BBM. You can't do much more than that with the tools in your kit at this point in this presentation. You're increasing the fraction of inspired air that the patient is getting, but it's just not enough. Now it's indicated for you to put in an advanced airway. Okay, we need to protect his airway and we need a better way to deliver oxygen. So I'm gonna delegate somebody to continue bagging with what you're seeing, two person bagging. What I'm gonna add in though, is I need to get my patient prepared for the procedure of advanced airway. Why do I have to do this? Well, atmospheric air contains 78% of nitrogen and about 21% of oxygen. And then you've got a 1% of just other gases in there that really are kind of inconsequential to what we're about to achieve. So I'm gonna flow this nasal cannula at 15 liters a minute in conjunction with my BVM at 15 liters a minute for two to three minutes. You must spend the time doing this. You're gonna see the sat rise, probably up over 90%, but look at how hard you're having to work to get that sat to rise over, over close to 100%, pretty darn hard. And the other 
wonder if she was bagging somebody like this. If you did see your sat go up to 100%, be like, oh, I'm not going to put in the advanced airway. Two things. One, you're bagging air into their belly. They have a high risk of throwing up, and as soon as they throw up unconscious, they're going to aspirate, meaning all that vomit that comes up is probably going to go in their lungs, and then you are going to have a mess on your hands to deal with. Because people who aspirate and they have junk in their lungs that shouldn't be there, you're going to fight to improve their SpO2. So we have to avoid that situation. That's why we're putting in the advanced airway. This nasal cannula is there to prepare your patient for the procedure. What we're doing is we're taking nitrogen in atmospheric air and we're wiping it out. We're replacing it with pure O2. And what that's ultimately going to do is buy you and I time to put in the advanced airway where our patient doesn't desat quickly. And I want you to consider children. Children, pediatrics, will desat a lot faster than adults because their functional residual capacity, how well their lungs can fill and recoil with air as they breathe in or out, is a lot smaller than in adults. So their desaturation period is a lot faster than what we would be as healthy young females and males. So I've done this for two to three minutes. My sats come up to 100%. I'm feeling good, I'm ready to go. So I'm gonna get my equipment prepared. Please consider that someone's continuing to bag. First thing I need to do is I'm going to take an eye gel. And I'm going to size it to my patient. It's based off of ideal body weight. So my patient is an 80 kilo patient, as you can see on an eye gel. You got the weight right underneath there for you to make your considerations. So we're gonna choose a number four. I need to check that the tube doesn't have any malformations or deformities on it. And if it does, I need to not use it. If you had a little burr on the end of your eye gel, little piece of plastic that was sticking out, you can rip open the pharynx and you're going to have bleeding that you have to deal with. And that's never fun in an airway. Okay. Then I'm going to take my lube and I'm going to put lube right here on my holder. And then you're going to lube the back end of your eye gel. That's the part that we need to slide in. No other place do you need to be putting lube. Then I'm gonna have a plan with my team, okay? If I've got a, a tube holder, it can go underneath the neck at this point. We should be totally prepared. If not, we can use tape. So again, somebody's still bagging, two person bagging is going on. I need to verbalize with my team what I'm about to do. So I'm going to say, I'm going to put in the eye gel. Uh, partner number two, please get your stethoscope on the belly. So that way, when the eye gel is inserted, I'm going to attach a BBM. And my first breath, you're going to tell me if you have any gurgling in the stomach. Is everybody clear about what we're about to do? Yes? All right, on a count of three. One, two, three. You do not need to rush. Disconnect the mask. Turn your peep down to five. Now at five, put that to the side. Okay, you can remove the nasal cannula, pull out the NPAs, put them on the chest, pull out the OPA, put the NPA, put the nasal cannula back in the nose. Put the patient in the sniffing position. Open the mouth. Eye gel straight towards the back around the tongue until it doesn't go any further. You have an integral line on your eye gel. It's black underneath the size. That should be at the teeth. If not, you need to go one size smaller, okay? Or try pushing down further. As soon as it's pushed down, immediately, we're now going to hold it. And partner number two, let's confirm. I'm gonna give a ventilation. Do you hear any gurgling? My partner tells me no, wonderful. Next spot that you, confirm your tube is at the left apice of your lung breath your partner will now move the stethoscope to the right apice breath i should be seeing chest rise my partner should be hearing breath sounds over to the left base breath and then he should move it to the right base breath your first five breaths are confirmation breaths and as you can see i did not take my sweet time doing this I am breathing for somebody. You need to be organized and have your plan enacted. So once that is all ready to go, then I'm gonna tape down my tube, okay? Pardon me. So I'm just gonna disconnect this for a moment, but there's no reason for you to have to do that. It's because I'm by myself at this time. Now, how you tape this down, there's lots of different ways. 
Please keep the roll of tape connected so you're not having multiple little tiny pieces of tape. You can go around the tube to the other side of the face. That's one way to do it. That's the way I'll demonstrate today, okay? Now, when somebody hasn't been breathing for a while, what happens is CO2 breathe, uh, builds up in their system. And CO2 combines with water as a chemical reaction in your body and becomes carbonic acid. And that acid dissociates into bicarb and hydrogen ions. And those hydrogen ions, they, are, they can just be little devils. What they do is they build up in your body and they make our blood acidotic. And what we see on our monitor is an ETCO2 that reads 62. Anything over 45 means our blood is acidotic. We have got to correct that. So the orders to your team after we've done our advanced airway insertion, first things first is your rate changes to one breath every six seconds so that you're providing now 10 breaths a minute. That's basic. Now we're looking at ETCO2 and we see it's 62, so the order will become, Anna, you need to breathe one breath every three seconds. I want you to watch breath by breath, the number 62 come down to between 35 and 45. And when you get to 35, 45, I want you to go back to one breath every, three se every five seconds, pardon me. Do you understand? And Anna would say, I do. And so I'm going to be a good partner up at the airway, one breath every three seconds. And the thing with ETCO2 is you will watch it change with every single breath you provide because it is a breath by breath monitor. So my ventilations, one breath every three seconds are starting to bring the ETCO2 down to 52, 48, 43. Okay, we're down in that range. Now I'm gonna go back to one breath every five seconds. One, two, pardon me, one breath every six seconds. Three, four, five six one two three four five six and i'm going to maintain etco2 between 35 and 45 and you are now at the point that you are responsible to be able to do all of this and all of this happens quite quickly so i hope that helps you to understand the failed airway approach the last thing i'd like to say is this approach does not apply in cardiac arrest that is not what a failed airway is. A failed airway only applies to somebody who is alive. In cardiac arrest, we go from OPA, BVM, 30 and two. We do our round of CPR. If they stay dead, maybe we have to work with the monitor a little bit. At that point, you're gonna go straight into an advanced airway. As soon as the advanced airway is in, same stuff. We have to turn our peep down to five. We're gonna give some breaths. And we're gonna do one breath every six seconds with continuous compressions. So there is no preparation of the patient. The crisis is already there. It's as bad as she gets. What we have to do is get an advanced airway in so we can do the continuous compressions so that we can maintain and improve coronary perfusion pressures so that when we provide a defibrillation, the heart is as primed as we can get it. So I hope that helps you all in understanding. Uh, I can be reached at annalise.schleider at safe.ca if you have any questions and any of the instructors, this is current practice on the street, any of us can go through this with you. So, good luck out there.